Yeah, I think the last time I worked on binary formation was uh, my thesis. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I did I did something at the time. Okay, so uh, thanks very much, and it's my pleasure to be here again. Um, today, what I'll be focusing on is in it, the the control and controlling star formation is how the effects of feedback from massive stars, massive young stars, uh, affects the environment of these stars and the larger scales around them and ends up controlling both the star formation rate and efficiency and also the properties of the interstellar medium. So the very short version of my talk is that I'll argue on small scales, that is scales of individual clouds, the star formation efficiency uh, can be, it's really the star formation efficiency that, that feedback affects. On intermediate scales, kind of scale of order the scale height of the disk or of, of order parsec, uh, what is controlled is the star formation rate. And then on the very largest scales, what's controlled is, is essentially the, what is the material that we actually find in galaxies. So I actually first gave a talk on a similar topic at the IAS uh, almost exactly five years ago. So November 22nd, you guys were a little bit off in your invitation. Um, so uh, I guess, or the person who was talking that day, let's see, 22nd. So uh, I don't know who was talking that day, this schedule, who didn't cancel. Um, so, uh, and, and, and back then, um, what I was describing was a theory of star formation um, that, that is essentially controlling star formation rates. And what I focused on is the idea that there's an equilibrium star formation rate. And in this equilibrium, the star formation rate will adjust until the, um, the, you satisfy the requirements for equilibrium if you think about energy gains and losses and uh, vertical equilibrium in the overall gravitational potential. So, uh, and, and the reason for my title then of the um, um, saying it's an efficient market, really the argument is that the star formation rate is whatever it needs to be in order to make up the energy that's lost to radiation and to provide the momentum that is required for force balance. <coughs> so today I'll give uh, something of a progress report on that work, which is actually much deeper in several respects. Um, and the improvements on the numerical side are, I won't point at Chenggu with, uh, in person with the laser pointer, but he's in back there. Um, and uh, so really largely due to his, his uh, efforts on really making these uh, simulations much more physically realistic. And I'll show some of his beautiful MHD simulations um, that show the, uh, a very realistic view of the three phase star forming interstellar medium. Uh, Munan Gong here, so there's Munan. Where's Munan? Munan. There's Munan. Um, uh, so Munan Gong, ha Gong has also been involved in this, uh, particularly on the um, um, kind of more the observable end, that is looking at the what the um, the chemical nature of the of the cold part of the um, star forming interstellar medium is and looking at observables, and I'll show you a little bit of what she's doing to connect these, these large-scale models to observables in molecular tracers. <coughs> uh, so in addition, in addition to going deeper, uh, doing more physics on the galactic scale, we've also been going uh, broader, or at least up and down, up and down, um, and that is to smaller scales and larger scales. And so uh, in particular, Aaron, and Sudhir and Zhang Yu have all been involved in um, understanding the star formation efficiency uh, in, in individual clouds that are forming star clusters. Uh, and uh, so Sudhir, you know, he actually got his PhD in August. Aaron just uh, finished his postdoc here and moved on to California. And Zhang Yu was a visiting graduate student um, for two months this fall. And finally, uh, I'll talk at lunch about work that Alwyn has been doing with me. I think I saw Alwyn. Alwyn. There's Alwyn. Uh, uh, on, um, I'll say a little bit at, at lunch about work he's been doing with me on um, winds from galaxies that are driven by cosmic rays. <coughs> okay, so before um, you know, talking about what's going on physically, this is, you know, in, this is kind of the big picture of what we're after, that is, what is, you know, after all, we, we see this history of star formation in the universe, but there's a lot of physics behind that. And if we want to hope to understand this history of star formation in the universe, we really have to understand that uh, physics. 
So that is what is actually happening to the ISM on small scales. And even if you look at kind of the picture of individual galaxies, the population not as a function of time, but just the instantaneous population that we, that we still have right now, um, this is very biased. So we're not seeing the baryons in the universe as stars, and in particular uh, in galaxies, you know, we're only seeing up to a third of the, bar of the baryons as stars. So the, what people believe is that either the gas has been driven out or it never fell in. And the, um, the expectation or the kind of belief is that low mass uh, kind of on to the left of this peak at low masses, star formation is responsible for, uh, feedback from star formation is responsible for driving mass out of those halos so that you uh, see a very small stellar complement. And then um, whereas on the high end, the belief is that um, the uh, feedback from AGN of some kind is sufficiently heating the halo that it may limit the, the accretion of gas. <coughs> so that's the kind of belief. But to actually get at this and to you know, really think that you're doing the physics, you have to actually do the small scales. And uh, so this is just, a, just to show you, you know, this is, it's not just the cosmologists uh, who are telling us that we have to have, you know, that we have to have winds. We actually see winds directly. Um, so this is an example from uh, of a wind in, the, in, a, in a nearby galaxy that I'm sure everyone has seen this. This is in, in, seen in dust. And here's the galaxy, um, just the optical version and the, and the dust. So we know ga galactic winds are there, um, but the kind of recipes that people are using currently for feedback uh, are really subgrid recipes that are not directly motivated by physics. And you can get very different answers depending on what you put in. So it's important to actually do the small scales self-consistently before you say that you have a recipe uh, that you can explain um, the large scales. So in star formation regulation, there's a range of scales. And as I said, the infall and winds can, can ultimately determine the content of a galaxy. So that's kind of global regulation of star formation. So, but what, what I'm really interested in uh, for the purposes today are, are the local regulation. That is, how is star formation regulated on small scales by direct physics that, you know, solutions of the uh, MHD equations. And of course, the local feeds back on the global. Okay, so, uh, so why feedback and what do we mean by feedback? Well, the reason we need to have feedback is that if there were no feedback, the diffuse ISM, that is the, um, the uh, atomic medium or the molecular medium that makes up most of the mass in galaxies, uh, it would, depending on whether it's cold or warm, uh, the turbulence would dissipate and basically a crossing time, the gas would cool in a million years or, or, or less, depending on what phase it is, and all the mass would end up collapsing into dense clouds. So then what would happen to these clouds? Well, if you took these individual clouds within them, you, you, know, you now have an even shorter dynamical time. And if there were no feedback, they'd just all collapse and, uh, and, and end up in stars or black holes. So uh, we know that doesn't happen. And it's quite evident, you know, the, um, almost all of the beautiful images that you see uh, from, um, you know, in publications in uh, kind of public um, outreach kind of publications are, are, are of star formation or its effects in one way or another because those are the prettiest things you can look at. So, uh, so they're pretty, but they also have a lot of physics in them. Um, and so what, what are these different processes? Well, the feedback includes the radiative heating. So that's really pervasive throughout the interstellar medium. The far UV photons can get a long way, and they're really what is heating the atomic medium um, the uh, H2 regions, of course, form around in the in immediate environment of massive, massive and luminous stars where uh, the ionizing radiation can reach. Uh, so that's quite important for the environments, the, massive, the clouds that those massive clusters are born in. Uh, then radiation pressure can be important, for, uh, particularly for the um, uh, more luminous and <coughs> clouds um, clusters that are in uh, higher surface density clouds. And finally, supernovae are, in fact, the most important overall uh, form of feedback. 
So the basic concept of self-regulation is pretty straightforward. The idea is that if you, you, know, you have some gaseous system, and if you allow some piece of this gas to collapse and make new stars, uh, some of those stars will be high mass stars. They return their energy to the environment, and you can c prevent collapse of the whole system. <coughs> so uh, I'll start by discussing what the effects, in particular, of radiation feedback from star clusters is on the parent um, molecular cloud, so because we see this radiation directly. And so, you know, here is the, here's the prototypical uh, massive uh, cloud that's forming massive stars. This is the nearest region of massive star formation in Orion. Here's the cloud. Here's what you see if, you know, it's winter time, so you can go out and look at Orion. Uh, here's where the molecular gas actually is, so that's a CO map. <coughs> okay, so if you close up, uh, if you look, uh, if you look close up on the, um, the Orion uh, nebula cluster, that's what it looks like. Um, and, uh, but the total mass in, st in stars in Orion, the total star formation efficiency, is only about 1%. And uh, if you look at other, um, other molecular clouds and their stellar populations in the galaxy, so this is actually star formation rate, so multiply by, I think that they used a time scale of about uh, 5 million years. So just multiply by 5 to get the star formation efficiency. And you can see that the efficiencies are of order a percent, you know, maybe up to 10% uh, in, in, um, of the star formation efficiency observed in molecular clouds. Now, one thing to, you know, take this with a grain of salt, because how do you define star formation efficiency? If you're looking after the cluster is formed, then it's already started to disperse the cloud. If you're looking early on, then you, know, you may have, uh, it depends on the time scale that you're looking. So this, is a, this question is, is uh, you will be biased towards a high star formation efficiency or a low star formation efficiency, depending on where you point, you know, whether you're pointing to uh, a peak of molecular gas or a peak of stars or you know, the largest radius you include. So, this is not a simple question to actually define star formation efficiencies. But um, basically, the, the evidence is that they are not more than about 10%. Okay, so uh, one thing that you can, you know, the most obvious thing that you would look at is what does ionizing radiation do? And this is from some uh, work by Dale and collaborators. So they looked at, um, this is with an SPH code, so what they just put photons into the medium. Um, and that can produce some photoevaporation, but in addition to that, the ionized gas has high pressure and that can push some gas away. Uh, so what they found, though, is that the fraction of mass that is unbound is always pretty small. Um, this is after three million years. So the, the unbound fraction is always pretty small, and it's really only um, uh, significant when the escape speed is, um, is quite low. So this is, this is kind of saying that the very little gas would actually become unbound, um, at least within three million years. <coughs> okay, so, so this is, you know, this is kind of a, a nominal um, perspective, which is that a, a high mass cloud, which has a high escape speed, would basically leave, uh, not lose very much gas at all. <coughs> so one thing that we uh, looked at is to ask, well, you know, look further and look, kind of explore the parameter space and ask, if you have a spherical cloud and the star formation efficiency is limited just by saying, you know, you make a certain um, mass in stars, that can create a certain um, amount of ionized gas in, the, in, the, in this spherical system. Uh, if you take the pressure of that ionized gas plus the corresponding radiation pressure, at what efficiency would you disperse the rest of the cloud? So it's basically kind of a force balance problem. And um, so what's shown here, this is saying, if you destroy the cloud when the shell expansion speed is equal to the escape speed, that would say that for typical cloud surface densities of about 100 solar masses per square parsec, you would have between 1 and 10% efficiency. <coughs> so that looks, okay, that, you'd say that looks pretty good compared to observations. And just what this green band here is, is uh, above that green band, radiation pressure is doing all of the expulsion. Uh, below that green band, um, gas pressure is doing all the expulsion of the cell, uh, surrounding shell. And the green band is, is 
the, those, those are cases where the solution goes from um, uh, gas, from radiation pressure dominated at small scales to gas pressure dominated at large scales. So you look at those numbers and you say, okay, maybe that can um, explain what's happening in observed clouds. <coughs> so, uh, but that's a spherical model. So, uh, you know, you should, um, you know, take that with a, with a, for, we know that clouds are not spherical, so we know that there should be a number of other effects that, um, uh, that alter the, the dynamics. So, so we wanted to look at this with, um, with numerical simulations. So if you're thinking about what, what does the non-ionizing radiation do, uh, every, every photon has some momentum, which is just the energy divided by the speed of light. Therefore, the maximum force that you can get if you absorb all of that radiation is L over C. Uh, some of those photons will be, well, all of those photons will be that are absorbed will be re-radiated in the IR. And so if that is also trapped, then you can get an additional um, kick from that in principle up to the total optical depth. But again, that's assuming that all of that radiation uh, again interacts with the matter in an optimal way. So we've looked at this using radiation hydrodynamic simulations. Um, and the simulations have a model, models of turbulent clouds and wherever collapse occurs, we replace the collapsed gas or collapsing gas with star particles. And we do the simplest possible thing of assigning them a luminosity, which just fully samples from the IMF. <coughs> OK, so here's an example of a cloud model. This is a 50,000 solar mass cloud um, with an initial radius of 15 parsecs. So the initial surface density is kind of comparable to observed surface densities of, of clouds. And what you're seeing as this evolved, these are star particles representing uh, kind of subclusters. And as this evolves, you're looking at the total surface density of gas. And this material is pushed out as the, as the luminosity increases and the radiation pressure force increases. Okay. So each of these points here is the efficiency of star formation, the net efficiency at the end of the simulation as a function of cloud surface density for many different models. Uh, so what's, you know, how can you understand this? The basic way to understand it is that there's a radiation force per unit area that if you match to the gravitational force per unit area gives you a maximum surface density. You can think of that as an Eddington surface density uh, that can be expelled. So over time, you know, initially the luminosity be, will be very low, so the Eddington surface density is low and everything would be, almost everything would be bound. But as the efficiency increases over time, the uh, luminosity increases and the luminosity allows for a larger um, surface density that can be expelled. So over time you can expel more and more material at higher and higher surface density. <coughs> um, so. Uh, if, you, if you just treated the cloud as uniform and um, you said at, at, at what, what would the star formation need to be in order to expel uh, the remaining material, that is this dashed, uh, dashed curve here. So that would say typical clouds have about a 3% star formation efficiency. You know, why is that not true? Well, it's not true because the clouds are turbulent. And a much higher fraction of the material is in higher surface densities. A large fraction of the volume is at low surface densities. So the, you're basically wasting a large fraction of your photons that are giving a higher velocity to the low density material and not enough um, momentum to the high density material. So this is what the actual results are. And so that's much higher star formation efficiency, essentially because you are uh, not distributing the um, momentum equally among all of the um, material to be expelled. And the model that's shown here, this is actually a theoretical model fit, which you get by saying what efficient, so you can look at what star formation efficiency you need in order to expel the material at the actual log normal surface density. And so you can you know, go ahead and do that and that gives this prediction. <coughs> Okay, so, um, so th this is just another view of the same cloud. But the, the bottom line is that the star formation efficiency in, that, in, the, in this case ends up being uh, much higher than observations. Okay. 
so, um, so most re more recently, we've been adding to the non-ionizing radiation, which um, you know there are these effects from turbulence, so it ends up giving you a higher star formation efficiency than you might expect. But uh, another thing that was missing there was the effects of ionizing radiation. So, um, so we've now included that, and this is work that um, Jiang Yu Kim has been doing, who uh, just went back. Uh, last week. So this is a cloud now that has both ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. What's shown on the right here is the emission measure as this cloud evolves. And on the left is this is just the total surface density and the locations of the uh, star cluster particles. Are there supernovae no. So these are without supernovae. So that would be the next thing to include. <coughs> And um, so this shows some uh, results from his simulation. So this is looking at, actually, the looking at either one or the other. So blue is used including only radiation pressure. Red is including only ionized, um, uh, ionizing photons. <coughs> and so this shows the final star formation efficiency. And you'll notice that for each cloud model, they're actually the effects of radiation pressure and the, uh, and the ionized gas or ionization are actually not different in, you know, they're not too different. Um, the, the ionizing radiation is actually more important in all cases, but it's, it's, it's not too dissimilar. Um, and this does give lower star formation efficiencies than uh, in the case of, of radiation pressure. So this gives, you know, of order 10 percent in, in kind of t a typical observe, you know, kind of typical observable system. So that would give in some sense, this could explain the upper limit on the observed efficiencies. And what's shown here is just to illustrate that um, most of the mass is actually lost in, uh, in essentially direct photo evaporation. The, the uh, gas pressure, um, the dynamical effects are actually less important than the um, direct photo evaporation. And the photo evaporation is mainly from the low density medium. So on this, in this direction, in, in, in fact, the, the um, uh, the turbulence kind of helps you because it creates much more low density gas than you would otherwise have, which is easier to uh, photo evaporate. <coughs> okay, um, so now let me turn to kind of a more extreme environment. We were talking about uh, globular clusters and super, super star clusters. So uh, I'll, I'll turn to the case um, where you have an extremely high surface density cloud, um, which is in fact a surface density so high that it would be above the Eddington limit, even if you turned all of the um, uh, Eddington limit for the surface density, even if you turned all of the gas into stars. So radiation pressure by itself, um, uh, the, the first photons would not help you. Um, and these have short enough dynamical times that essentially supernova could never form before it evolved dynamically. So this is just showing you um, what a uh, cloud looks, this is, this is at some point in the evolution of, this is a cloud that has a million solar masses within a radius of 10 parsecs. And this is showing you the gas distribution and also a bit hard to see here, but the contours of radiation pressure and the direction of the uh, radiation flux. So these simulations have only the, um, uh, only the reprocessed radiation and again, this um, is emitted from the locations of star cluster particles. So what is, you know, a key parameter is the opacity for dust. And here we're using a fairly high opacity, um, higher than observed opacities, uh, so of 20 centimeters squared per gram. And so that would represent a Rosslyn mean opacity. You would have to have be dust enriched by maybe, I'd say about a factor of four to get that kind of opacity. So over time, you can see that the material is dispersed in this simulation. <coughs> so this shows um, tracks for the evolution of the gas. This is the gas mass relative to the initial mass um, in each simulation. This is the stellar mass relative to the initial mass. And this is the, these curves are the ejected material. And the thing to notice here is that um, there's there's basically you know two categories. There's the category where the um, where the material that's ejected is here about 10 percent. Okay, so why is, are those are all 10 percent? Why is it 10 percent? It's 10 percent because that's just the material that's ejected by the initial turbulence. If we had a bigger, emptier box, 
um, it wouldn't be ejected, but that would be very expensive empty space, uh, kind of a simulation mansion, a mega mansion. Um, so, so rather than having expensive empty space, we know that that ejected fraction is just kind of due to the uh, the details of the of the simulation. So essentially, all of these cases, which are the low kappa cases, kappa of one, five, and ten, would have essentially 100% uh, star formation efficiency. It's reduced by 10% because of the box size. On the other hand, everything tw 20, 30, and 40, all of you know, this group has uh, ejects more material, and you can see that there's a difference among these. And um, so this is the balance that goes into stars in the end. So the uh, mass loss really strongly depends on opacity. So with uh, essentially 100% efficiency for, for low opacities and of order 50% efficiency for the higher opacities. So say that again? Uh, yes. So this is, these are each 50%. Um, I mean, it's not exactly, but um, yeah. So there is, there, is, there is a little bit of mass added because we have to have a floor in the density. Yeah. So it's not exactly summing to unity. Um, okay, so you can actually understand for the infrared case what the, um, you know, the, essentially the Eddington calculation quite simply. So suppose you look at a, a spherical shell at some distance from a, a radiation source. Um, in fact, you don't, it doesn't need to be spherical. You could just look at some little piece of it. The optical depth in that shell is, is just the opacity times the surface density. Um, then there's gravity, which is pointing inward. Uh, so the the total that's the total gravita the gravitational force inward, the radiation force outward, which is just luminosity over C times um, the optical depth. And you can ask, you can take their ratio, and that's the Eddington ratio. And uh, that Eddington ratio just depends on this psi, which is the ratio of luminosity to mass on the opacity and on C and G. Not on this scale. So these are only kind of parsec scale. Yeah, so or a few tens of parsec, up to, you know, of order 10 parsec. So the differential rotation, I think, tidal effects are not important on this scale. So this Eddington ratio just depends on kappa. And the low kappa cases are, are subcritical. The high kappa cases are supercritical. So you can understand the effects in the simulation just based on what that uh, opacity is. That is, these are the sub-Eddington cases which have high star forming efficiency. Those are the super-Eddington cases. <coughs> um, and that's the, that's the Eddington ratio. And this is, so, but the, the thing to take away is that the, uh, to actually be super Eddington with respect to the, um, with respect to, to the infrared, you actually have to have quite high op opacity, and that means you would have to be dust enriched. So, um, so that's hard to do, and so that means that if you have a, oh, and I guess I didn't, so, um, right, the, I didn't say specifically what the time scale was, but that, that cloud has basically completes its evolution in less than four million years. So the, um, so there would have been no supernovae by the time uh, the evolution finished. <coughs> so, sorry? Not significantly shorter than four million years. Um, so the, uh, so I think that this can kind of explain the st high observed star formation efficiencies that are seen in in kind of these clouds that host uh, superstar clusters. So here's an example um, from a Nature letter uh, last, I think this was last year. Um, the, uh, this very massive cloud um, in um, um, this, this dwarf galaxy, um, which has a quite high star formation efficiency. So the star formation efficiency is about 60%. So I think that you know, even if it had somewhat <coughs> enriched metallic dust abundance and metallicity, you could still explain this high star formation efficiency in um, in these this kind of isolated 
a very extreme cloud, <coughs> very high surface density, uh, very isolated kind of system. But this kind of star formation efficiency is, is much higher than we observe in uh, kind of more typical Milky Way clouds. So why is there this difference, and why is the, you know, why is the star formation efficiency so much lower overall in molecular gas? Um, so you look at, you know, these are individual clouds, like Orion, it has star formation efficiency of 1%. Well, I think, you know, a big part of the answer is these clouds are, you know, in this rest of this mess. So they're participants in the overall interstellar medium. <coughs> so let me move up in scale now and um, talk about the large scales, um, the large scale gas and the large scale star formation, where we now have, for several years, we've had surveys so that we can actually say something on a local scale of, um, of several hundred pars parsecs up to a kiloparsec or so about what the local star formation, um, how the local star formation uh, depends on the local properties rather than just a, a global average which mixes everything up. <coughs> So here, um, this is actually a slide I showed last time, and, and uh, I think this is useful because it does show you um, that uh, the star formation you know, rate looks, has this kind of behavior. People talk about the so-called Kennecott-Schmidt relation. Um, it's actually more subtle when you look at uh, resolved galaxies. So in particular, uh, there's kind of a linear relation in this intermediate uh, regime, then it's steeper when you get to high surface densities. And you see, in particular, a lot of scatter if you look at star formation rate as a function just of gas surface density at the low end. So what this, you know, you could say, oh, there's a lot of scatter, or you could say, oh, there's another parameter that I have not put in my plot. And I would say that uh, the other parameter is important. And one of the other parameters was identified um, really about this time. Uh, which is the stellar surface density. So the stellar surface density, as you go to higher stellar surface density, the star formation rate per unit gas mass is increasing. So higher surface density, and there's, there's many um, more uh, recent observations that really show the same thing, that at high stellar, where the stellar surface density is high, the star formation rate is also high. This was, in some sense, anticipated by uh, Blitz and Roslovsky, who showed that the ratio of H2 to H1 increases with the pressure, the, the expected pressure in the gas, which is proportional to the square root of the stellar volume density. Um, and so, you know, if you increase the H2 content and then you make stars out of that, that would lead to this kind of star formation rate uh, versus um, uh, increase in gas pressure effect. So why does star formation increase with this hydrostatic pressure? Basically because I would argue that it's from feedback. That is, what's increasing with the star formation rate is the reaction. You're getting more thermal and more turbulent and more magnetic pressure. And it's that pressure which ends up having to uh, you regulate star formation by saying, when has that pressure met the needs uh, of balancing um, the gravity? <coughs> So if you apply this self-regulation concept on large scales, um, what you need to know is you need to know how much energy and how much momentum do you put in per unit mass of, of stars. Because that's what you have to kind of, that's, that's the bookkeeping you have to do in order to determine uh, what you would need to maintain the equilibrium. <coughs> um, OK, so, uh, so, so that's the concept, more, more kind of the the uh, cartoon version of this. Let's just think about the case of turbulence because, um, in fact, the ISM is dominated by turbulence, not by a thermal pressure. Turbulence is the largest component of the pressure. <coughs> so if you take this box that contains some mass M and uh, its volume is L cubed, and you put in, you have some star formation rate in it, the, um, so there's stars that form, uh, and each of the mass of stars will is assumed to eject some momentum to its surroundings. So there's some momentum injection rate, which is just proportional to the star formation rate. Uh, and that M, that M star there is the mass, total mass in stars formed per, um, per mass of star or per unit momentum. So that's the driving rate. Then since turbulence dissipates in a crossing time, uh, you can say that that would be the dissipation rate. 
You can do this in terms of energy as well, basically multiplying both of these by a velocity dispersion, same thing. Um, so, and then if you do a balance between driving and dissipation, uh, you'll get a, a star formation rate that's needed to maintain this kind of equilibrium, which depends on the velocity dispersion. But that velocity dispersion in equilibrium is just set by the total mass and size of the system. So this is kind of the expectation for self-regulated star formation. It depends on the total mass, which could be stars, dark matter, gas, the mass and gas, the size of the system, and that momentum per unit mass. <coughs> so that's the idea. Uh, it actually is simpler if you, you know, there's, so you'd say, well, this still has a free parameter, which is this, which is this L, but in a disk system, really everything is constrained to be in a plane. So you could look at the mass per uh, unit, you know, per unit area um, uh, formed in stars per unit time. That's a star formation rate. So basically, if we take this and we divide by L squared, then everything on the right-hand side is a surface density. So as long as everything is constrained to be in a plane, now you have this kind of relationship where essentially you take the surface density as, as, as your free parameter and the uh, feedback. <coughs> And so this makes a prediction that if you're dominated, for example, by the gas uh, and the stellar contribution or dark matter is not important, then essentially star formation is only determined by that largest component uh, of the, you know, there's, there's two parts of this. One is the fuel and the other is gravity. And it's all independent of the details of turbulence. Um, it's independent of things that are happening on small scales. And it's really just uh, kind of a reflection of you know, conservation law uh, in the momentum conservation. That is that the weight of the gas that's on this right-hand side, um, that pressure just has to be balanced by the momentum flux, which is injected. <coughs> so that gives a star formation rate per unit area, which will be proportional to the dynamical pressure. Is that negative here? So uh, no, I mean, it adds, so basically, um, you can get additional factors in the denominator here. So the magnetic field actually decreases the star formation rate by about, say, uh, 30%. Can you hear the increase in this to get the mass to get the mass? Say that again? Can you hear the increase in this to get the mass to the magnetic field? Uh, no, I don't think so. Because it's depressing. But this is at larger scales. Um, yeah, maybe we'll talk about that later. And this is just showing you know, the results of simulations compared to observations in this regime where, um, where the, the gas dominates. So that's that prediction. OK, so, but this all had to assume, you know, we had to assume something for the momentum per unit mass. And so this adopted uh, what you, you the, the simulations from um, the 80s and 90s said about the momentum you get from a, um, a radiative supernova remnant. But you could worry that um, that momentum you know, from a radiative supernova remnant in a spherical medium might be different from what it is in a turbulent medium, just as the momentum injection you know, we found um, from radiation pressure. It go, a lot of it goes through holes, so you might be concerned about that um, for the case of supernovae as well. So we, uh, so we wanted to look at this, and other people also looked as well at, you know, if you have a realistic ISM, how much momentum do you get from each supernova? So this is just showing kind of the, the, the comparison state, which is a uniform medium that has an expanding supernova remnant. And this shows the momentum over time. It increases essentially up to uh, shell formation time. That's the cooling time. Um, when essentially when the cooling time in the post-shock gas is equal to the dynamical time, uh, then it cools. It cools at this time, and uh, it gives you um, a total momentum per supernova, which is that value. <coughs> so that's the point of comparison. So here's um, uh, some simulations. So based on the simulations that Chenggu did, we wanted to measure what is the momentum in injection um, in this you know, more realistic interstellar medium that has clouds. These clouds are overdensed by a factor of 100 relative to the ambient um, intercloud medium. These are cold H1, that's uh, warm H1. So this shows momentum over time. These are different realizations. Of course, any given realization will have slightly different, uh, you know, the clouds are in different places, so that affects 
the details, but the, um, the momentum is very close, in fact, to what it is for a uh, uniform medium. It's insensitive to the density, and it's quite similar to the uniform medium case. So you could also say, well, in fact, uh, supernovae are clustered, and this is just showing results of simulations. Um, we had an undergraduate student, uh, Roberto Raleanu, who was involved in this project as well. Um, so if you have repeated supernovae at the, in a cluster, uh, and they make something that's much larger than an individual supernova remnant. They make a superbubble. So what is the momentum per a supernova in a superbubble? That's what's shown here. This is in units of 10 to the 5 solar masses kilometer a second. And you can see, so these are simulations that have different ambient density, different supernova rate, and it gives you about a factor of two variation in the momentum per supernova. But it's, it's pretty close to, you know, it's not exactly constant, but um, there's, not, there's not a lot of variation in that. <coughs> so that means that that's consistent with what we had assumed in the kind of, in, in the starburst regime. Uh, and it also tells us what we should use when, um, when we're looking at, at um, if, we're not, if we were not resolving uh, the hot phase, what momentum we should, we should be using for supernovae. So, uh, so, so one of the things that we've done is not just the, the starburst regime, but also the large scale region and di large scale disks where uh, there's supernova feedback of the kind I just showed, but in addition there's radiative heating um, that is the far UV goes out and it heats the material and that sets the thermal pressure. Uh, and most recently, Chenggu and I have been developing, uh, Chenggu mainly, I should say, um, a much more complicated model which actually follows things in greater detail. In particular, um, we uh, include sink particles, so we have the exact delay time of supernovae. Uh, the energy is in, in injected at an earlier stage, so that creates a hot interstellar medium. This also makes the simulations much more expensive um, because the the uh, highest velocity is, is uh, you know, 1,000 kilometers a second instead of 100 kilometers a second. Um, and we also include a very tall box so that we can actually quantitatively assess wind driving. <coughs> and finally, um, so this might seem uninteresting, the numerical convergence, yawn, but actually this is telling you, um, you know, in a galaxy formation cosmological simulation, can you actually hope to resolve any of this? And I would say that um, I think it would be very difficult, at least with current simulations, but uh, what that shows is that you need, to, you need to develop a true physical subgrid model, which is based on resolved, um, uh, resolved simulations. So this is an example of, um, this is a solar neighborhood model uh, seen from above. So this is uh, what you're seeing in color scale is the gas surface density each of these colored particles is a uh, star cluster particle colored by its age. Um, you can see that these particles form in the high density, high surface density clouds. Then over time, uh, they will, uh, the, so that was just a burst of star formation and the supernovae are basically dispersing the material that is around them. Um, and uh, so this is, this is basically showing you what a piece of the ISM would look like if you follow it around the galaxy. And Chengu uh, came up with a very nice uh, and Princeton appropriate uh, acronym for this project. <coughs> okay, so a sideways view of the same thing is here. So this is, so this is kind of, you know, what does the interstellar medium look like around us? It basically, we would say it looks like this. So, um, so this is density, that's temperature, that's pressure. This is the vertical velocity upward on this side, downward on this side. Um, and uh, this is the magnetic field, magnetic pressure. So you can see that there are, um, uh, there are low density regions which correspond to high temperature. Those are basically super bubbles um, or hot bubbles. Um, this is a slice through the midplane. You can see the, the, the hot volume time averaged is of order half of the volume of the ISM. Um, and this hot gas can escape and, um, a, as a wind. There's some cooler material up here at two kiloparsecs, but 
it's, it, it falls down because it doesn't have a velocity that's high enough to escape. Okay, so in, um, uh, so if you want to think about self-regulation where you have both thermal and turbulent pressure, as I described before, you expect that the turbulent pressure to be proportional to the star formation rate per unit area. This is, you know, depends um, on the uh, momentum per unit mass. Similarly, from a balance of heating and cooling, the thermal pressure should be proportional to the star formation rate. You can also add to this uh, turbulent and uh, mean magnetic pressure, which would have a similar form to each of these. Um, so here I just wrote down um, the thermal and turbulent. The magnetic is, is kind of comparable to the, a little bit higher than the thermal. So that's too bad. Um, yeah, you can, uh, the magnetic field, um, you know, it's the, the, the uh, if turbulence goes away, you lose the turbulent part of the magnetic field, and the mean field, back to the beginning, um, the mean field, you, um, this is, we don't need to go back to the very beginning. Um, the, the mean field can be just lost through um, buoyancy. Uh, through buoyancy. Okay. Yay. Okay. The talk will go on. Uh, so, so then you can just write down what the dynamical equilibrium pressure should be, knowing the gas gravity and the stellar gravity. And that gives you a star formation rate, which depends on pressure. Um, and the exact coefficient depends on you know, what the yield is of this feedback. And in most regions of disks, not the very centers, the stellar gravity dominates, so you'd have this kind of relationship. And this shows from our earlier simulations, which had just a warm and cold ISM, um, that this linear relationship holds. This is from, this includes everything, uh, both the simulations that completed in the last uh, couple weeks and the earlier ones. And you can see that they follow this um, uh, star formation rate per unit area very close to linear scaling in uh, the pressure. And the most recent Tigris ones, here's the, the one I showed you. Then um, these are two higher surface density uh, simulations. <coughs> so that same relationship here is compared to observations here. Uh, both for, this is kind of outer disks, that's, that's kind of starburst conditions. And um, so the thing to take away from this is you, you have this kind of relationship and that really, this, inc this pressure includes all of the sources of gravity, not just the, not just the gas. And you know, that really can explain uh, the, what's missing in this. So I would argue that you shouldn't ever be plotting star formation rate versus gas surface density because you're missing uh, a key variable. Um, okay, so uh, in addition to, to you know, making a more realistic model of the ISM, we also want to be able to observe it um, and uh, help w the observers with their interpretation of what they observe. So looking at molecules is difficult because there's no, you can't observe the H2 when it's at low temperature because it doesn't have a permanent dipole moment. So people usually use CO, but the CO is actually optically thick, so it's kind of, you know, there's this empirical relationship between CO and H2 that people use, but there's no particular reason that that should be linear, um, you know, throughout all space and time. So this is uh, showing some, from some of the, these simulations, what the, um, what the H2 is from using a, a, a direct chemical model and also doing the radio transfer, that's the H2. And then this is the CO emission. Um, and uh, so this shows the XCO ratio, that is H2 over CO as a function of CO. This is the typical value that people use, um, that, that's the so-called Milky Way value here. So that seems pretty good for the um, higher surface density or higher WCO clouds, but it would fail uh, for the low surface density regions. So in addition to this, and this is just cloud masses, um, so, so the other thing that happens is you're missing gas that's not in H2. 
Um, So this is so this is actually post-processing, but um, the goal is actually to do time-dependent CO, so t time dependent chemistry. So then the key species to track, um, I guess Munan has maybe t 20 species. Yeah, so 20 species in the network. Um, but the key species are to track are the ones that actually are responsible for cooling um, from the point of view of the of the cooling. So that's C plus is the most important. Um, but also you want to, you actually want to also follow the chemistry in a time dependent way because otherwise that the, you may, over, if in post-processing there's a tendency to, if you're going to equilibrium, you're not allowing for the fact that, you know, material is moving around and it can be dissociated. It's not always at the, um, at the you know, it's not sitting there always at the same, um, uh, with the same shielding. Okay, so let me say also finally a little bit about winds. So um, here, this is the this is vertical velocity, colored uh, red for positive, colored blue for negative. So you can see that there is a a tendency. You know, this is preferentially outward on both sides, but it's certainly not always outward. And the values of the velocity. Um, so you know, this white is zero, so it's only red above 100 kilometers a second. So there's a lot of material that is less than 100 kilometers a second. So it's not a wind, it's a fountain. So most of that material is not at high enough velocity that, can, uh, that it can escape. Really, only the hot medium can escape from the galaxy. And this is, um, this is showing uh, the, this is the, the ratio of mass loss rate in the hot, ionized, and warm medium for three different models. You can see that it's about 10% of the, this is the hot medium, is about 10% of the uh, star formation rate per, that is the mass loss rate in the wind compared to the star formation rate is about 10%. That's the hot medium um, and the, um, uh, the ionized and, and warm are, are less than that. Actually, if you make an even bigger box, these, these decrease. <coughs> these are bigger boxes. So. Um, so that, that's really saying that it's difficult to drive uh, a substantial wind that could you know, drive out much of the mass in, in uh, stars in, um, um, just, just by the action of supernovae. And this is showing for super bubbles. This is, you can look at this as the mass above a certain velocity. So, um, so let's look at, focus on these dashed, dashed ones because those are the supernova rate that's most realistic. Um, so how much mass is there? So that's the amount of mass you would make in stars for each supernova. And so anything above this is saying you're, you could lose more mass than uh, you locked up in stars. And you can see that that is only the case at, um, you know, you can only do that at, you only get that much material at relatively low velocities. So you could drive a wind uh, from, supernovae could just by themselves drive a wind in a low mass halo, 50 kilometers a second or so, but not in a high mass halo. So, you know, this is, um, you know, this is, this 10 is, would be 10%, and that's really what we uh, see in, in the simulations. Okay, so uh, let me, I think.